The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Sup, Holmes? Beware, your host, Jonathan Holmes! That's me. Thanks, Sinistar. And you, Don, you sound Sinistarish as we speak. And February 17th, 17th it comes out on uh, DVD slash Blu-ray in the Americas. It's already in uh, America's hat, Canada. Uh, you can get that on Blu-ray uh, and DVD. Uh, you can check it out probably on Torrent, some, some sort of BitTorrent site. I'm sure you can look it up. Um, if you type in motiv motivational growth on uh, YouTube, you get 568,000 um, Russian uh, honeypot sites trying to get you to give them 3.99 because they'll just show the logo for like 90 minutes. Uh, if you see anything that's not 104 minutes, you know it's wrong. Uh, oh, got it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty uh, sizable length of film, and you you did this with your film studio, your film company. Yes, yes, Imagos Films. Imagos Films, uh, yeah. and you're also developing for people who hadn't guessed already uh, a video game called yeah. Razor, which is on Kickstarter. That's been on Kickstarter since Friday or Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Thursday, and here we are at Sunday, and it looks like you're almost a third of the way to funding already. Oh, yeah, we're at 56 or 7,000. I don't know. It's been, we were averaging like 1,000 an hour, which is pretty wow. cool, and I'm super excited. I'm waiting for the plateau and then the drop so that we'll, we'll get halfway there and then fail. It might. <laughs> I, I, I highly doubt it. And I saw one of my favorite current comic book artists. His name's Chris Burnham. He mm -hmm. threw the uh, uh, Grant Morrison run, more recent run of Batman and Robin. Yeah. He's kind of the definitive Damian Wayne artist. Damian Wayne, if people don't know, he's uh, Bruce Wayne's biological son. He's like an evil Robin. He's like beheaded people and stuff. Uh, he loves your game. He was tweeting yeah. about it. Yeah, you're, it's amazing. You're, you're getting big name, or at least in certain circles, people who are big names yeah. attracted to this game. What do you think it is about the game that's attracting people to it? Uh, I think that uh, the baby boomers all had kids, and the kids all grew up in the 70s and 80s, and we all saw the same stuff, and there's a lot of us. And uh, uh, I... I, my film company, uh, I'm sorry, my game company, Imigo Softworks, which is the, so Imigo is just sort of the overarching body. Well, I tell stories for a living, man, uh, both film stories and game stories. So that's, that, I don't think, I don't think they're necessarily, they're not interchangeable, and I really don't think convergence is a functional thing. We'll get into that in a minute. But I right. think uh, transmedia is definitely a, a positive thing, and my companies do both. Uh, they're right. basically the same group of people with satellite people on either side kind of pushing it. Anyway, my uh, my game company's uh, motto is Nostalgia in HD. So well, what I try to do with... Uh, let, I'm going to use an example. One of our, our um, really close dev friends is uh, Yacht Club Games. Yacht Club Games they did um, Shovel Knight. Oh, okay. uh, they, uh, we, we, we talked to them a bunch, and uh, we might even actually do a crossover. We're still working the details out. Uh, but uh, oh, we also, uh, Vert, their composer, uh, Jake Kaufman, is actually doing uh, some work for Star Mazer, so that's cool yeah, too. I saw that. That's awesome. But um, th they did something really amazing with Shovel Knight in, in so much as they took uh, the NES palette and the NES mechanics and the, all of the limitations of the, the original Nintendo Entertainment System, and they, they, they adhered slavishly to it, mm -hmm. which to, to a lot of people is extremely attractive, right, because that's... That's that's a, a recreation of something that they, they remember fondly. Uh, I, I'm completely different, though Shovel Knight is honestly my favorite game of 2014. Um, I have to say, uh, I like what it did because it reminds me uh, of, of playing N Nintendo games that I loved when I was a kid now. Mm. Uh, what I'm trying to make isn't that. What, what Imagos does is create games that feel like games felt when you were younger. Mm -hmm. um, Shovel Knight to me now at 35 looks and feels like a Nintendo game, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. And it does so incredibly, but for the couple extra colors in the palette, which are used to, to such great effect. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use an allegory for you. Uh, mm -hmm. If allegory is the right word, I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you a, a, a story. Um, sure. And it's analog to this scenario. Uh, I have a like $350 uh, Masterpiece Optimus Prime. I'll lean back. It's like this big. Right? It's huge. I got it from Japan. Yeah, it's called the Masterpiece. It's like MP001 or whatever. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's made out of like pressed steel and it's heavy and it's like a lot of money and it's it's just it's awesome. Um and I've had it for quite some time. I used to have it on a shelf. When you come into my apartment, you would see it. And without fail, 
And remember, this is it, it's it's got 250 points of articulation. It takes 10 minutes if you know what you're doing to transform the thing from a truck. Into, um, I would I would bring friends over, and if they'd never been to my house before, and they were like in my age range, they would come in and stop dead and look at it and say to me, "I had one of those when I was a kid." <laughs> and uh, no, no, you really didn't. That thing didn't even we didn't even have the technology to make the manufacturing to do this back in the 80s. You didn't have that. It didn't exist. What did exist, however, was a much smaller Optimus Prime G1 figure that was like diecast nickel. With uh-huh. like crappy plastic feet, and it, it had three art, three points of articulation, and it took uh, like 30 seconds to transform if you have half a brain. But when you were four, right, it was huge, and it was complicated, and it was metal or whatever. So you filled in all the gaps, you know, like mm. you, you you made it something really complex and interesting and heavy and awesome. I beat the hell out of a kid once with that little tiny thing when I was in a sandbox, just clocked him in the face and took part of his face off. That was the coolest thing. But nowadays, when you're an adult, you want that feeling. You want to go back to what it felt like when you were a kid. So what we're trying to do is evoke not this like slavish adherence to a thing, mm-hmm. but instead the thing you thought it was. Uh, Maddie Collector, Mattel, uh, they, they, they released this adult collector line of, of um, He-Man figures, right? The Masters of the Universe figures. I have all of them. I'm obsessed with them because they're like they're sculpted by a team called the Four Horsemen who look – who looked at your your historic idea of what He-Man was, mm-hmm. and then re-sculpted He-Man with like modern technology and like super high detail. And when you look at it, you're like, yes, that's He-Man. But then you look at it compared to like the old like <laughs> like uh, war rubber and like chipped plastic pressed piece of crap He-Mans from like 1984. You compare them. One of them is a piece of crap with no no resolution, and the other one is exactly what you thought that piece of crap was when you were seven. Right. Like, yes. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, I think it attracts immediately. I had um, – uh, I'm sorry to, to cross the streams here, but I had actually oh. a, joystick, a joystick writer came to the booth, and he said, I had to come because your game immediately hit me right right in the nostalgia. It hit me right here. And I said, that's because – and I unzipped my hoodie, and I said, it's because I did this and put it up there. <laughs> and you got it back. So I think it's attractive to people because it evokes that feeling you had when you were a kid. It's wondrous and beautiful. It's still pixely because that's also what you had when you were a kid. But I'm not – it's based on a TurboGrafx-16 game. Star Mazer, at least, is based on a TurboGrafx-16 style game. But it, the TurboGrafx-16 could never do anything. Like Any it. particular TurboGrafx-16 game? Well, because it's a, it's a, it's a uh, horizontal scrolling shooter and a point-and-click adventure game, I would say, like, Loom – because that came out on TG16, uh, uh-huh. or any any of those, uh, and uh, any of like the Star Soldier series. Even though those are vertical, it's still the same the concept. Sure. Gate of Thunder. Gate of Thunder was like, when I was, I don't know, nine, Gate of Thunder was the best thing that ever happened on Earth. I, mean, I don't think I ever played that one. I played a lot of Blazing Lasers. Like, Blazing Lasers the, is like... Yeah. I tried to show somebody who's under 30 blazing lasers. I'm like, listen, this is like, this is like a lesson on how to design a shooter. Mm-hmm. I put it in, and the kid's like, I don't even, and I'm like, you don't even. That's the point. You don't even. It's incredible. Every the upgrade system is incredible. The the, the 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 way it teaches you how to use each thing. He's just collecting all the power ups. You're supposed to yeah. selectively collect. Like it has a sort of in game mini game where like you you'll blow a thing up and like six power ups will come out and one of them is the one you want and like the other ones are like crap and oh, yeah. you have to dodge those along with dodging the bullets and everything. and it's part of it. He's like, it sucks. The bullet, the guns all kind of stuck all the time. So you gotta pick the thing. You're missing. You gotta power up one gun and right. see how far you can go with it. And then exactly, and you're dodging the fun when you accidentally get the gun you don't want. You're like, no, I have to learn how to yeah. use this. Just like in yeah. real life, sometimes it, you get fired and you have to get a job at McDonald's and then you make the best. Yes. Yeah, Blazing Lasers is like the life lesson game. It's basically The Sims. It's incredible. <laughs> I I'm a, I love in Blazing Lasers when you get the uh, the power up that changes all the time and you just uh-huh. shoot it forever until it turns into a kill everything on the screen bomb. Yeah. It's yeah. because the bass line when you hit it, it's like bow 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 bow. The sound effects. No, totally. So I'm a total Turbo Graphics 16 fan. But I didn't immediately when I saw Star Mazer, uh, why I got excited about it. It was in this order. Like, art direction, uh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Two, uh, I get to point on the guy's head and kill him. Like, how yeah. many point-and-click games have I played where I felt totally powerless uh, in that right. all I had to, to use was my uh, wits and the items I had and try to do different combinations? I always thought, why can't I just point on that bastard and kill him? Yeah. And yeah. now, I, for the first time, as far as, far as I'm aware, you have a point-and-click where it's uh, action-based with a point-and-click as it well as we- puzzle-based. We didn't. It, it's super puzzle based. Don't get us wrong, but we didn't want this idea where uh, you were you were pixel pecking. You know the thing where you just move your mouse back. You get bored. 
And he's like, oh, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. There's a thing in Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Fathers. So I don't know if you know this, but Gabriel Knight, Sins of the, Sins of the Fathers came out, uh, and at the same time they launched the Sierra call-in line. Oh, right. And for like, for like okay. four bucks a minute. You can call and get hints, right? So you can get about two-thirds of the way be- through Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers before it gets completely insane. It makes no sense. And it does so, so you call up Sierra, right, and, 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 and it was wonderful. They'd play like a 90-second like a, like a like intro song, which is already, that's like, <laughs> that's like $7. And then they'd be like, hello, and welcome to the Sierra Inline. We actually had the... Uh, yeah. We have the creator of Gabriel Knight on the show not that long oh, ago. Oh, wait. I you wish tell I... him he sold out. When you <laughs> have to scare the fucking snake, he sold out. You do not flip a switch to turn on a fan that lifts the things, that knocks a book over, that scares a snake. That expo- That's the dumbest thing. We actually have in our, in our office, we have a thing, don't scare the snake. It's like a... The idea is don't make a puzzle that's so obtuse that you have to, like, spend $60 on a helpline. By the way, when you're, like, 14 and you spend $60 on the Sierra helpline, it's just like ordering porn on the, the – your parents will hate you just as much as if they went on to, the, like, the, the, the pay-per-view and got, like, the 14 seconds of porn it takes you to, to, to get through it when you're 14. Like, it was – it's the worst. Don't do it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, <laughs> Interesting. Uh, 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 if and when we talk, it was Jane Jensen who created okay. that series, yeah. and she at that point, by Sins of the Father, was that when it was like getting live action with like Mark Hamill and Tim Curry and stuff. No, no. Tim Curry was the voice of of the original. The original Sins of the Father that was the first one. Uh, the, the Tim Curry was the voice. A lot, Michael Dorn was also in it, and a bunch of other cool cool dudes. Uh, but it was super beautiful pixel animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, my I understanding is they were like barking, uh, biting off more than they could choose budget wise, and then having no, to. Make it up later, but but and speaking of they you, made, they made up that budget by the. Fucking, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. the like, Sierra Helpline was paying yeah. Tim Curry's salary basically. We, we, uh, we bought the game and then I spent sixty extra dollars trying to figure out how to scare the snake. So let me get to your original point. Um, yes. Brick Stonewood, Brick M Stonewood. The N stands for metal. He's um a man out of time. He's uh like this like a star like a, star Mazer, right? It's star Mazer. Yeah. He yeah. he's he's the uh, the main character. He's he's a space cowboy. He was the greatest. Uh, uh, low cat uh, star wolf pilot uh, in the Great War, um, but he was lost in this giant like spatial rift thing for 130 years. So when he's found and he's un- unfrozen by these ingot miners, everything's different. He's in a totally different world. In his world, aliens use one bathroom and humans use another, and that kind of thing. And he always has a gun. Uh, guns are like super outlawed in like the new sort of civilization. Um, we wanted to get, have have that sort of uh, fish out of water feel, uh, frankly, because I'm making an allegory for like how I, I finally am at the point I can make a game, like really make a game for real with a team and money and budgets and everything. And and uh, I, I just want to make a game that I wanted to make when I was nine, and the whole world has changed. Nobody wants that game. So Rick Stonewood is a character that I would have made when I was like 12, but he totally doesn't fit in a more uh, you know, a more mature gaming universe. So we try to give the universe a mature gaming elements. Um, one of those, which is kind of funny because it harkens back to him being immature, is the idea that you have like look, use, walk to, and blast. Blast is always there. <laughs> Brick can shoot anything. He's basically Han Solo, except a little dumber and a lot more pretty. Uh, he can shoot anything. And that's kind of an important point because since the story, and we'll get into this I think a little bit later, but since the story is all um, modular and procedurally chunked, um, you can ruin your entire playthrough by, like, shooting the main guy. But you don't ruin your playthrough. You still have your 11 hours of playthrough, and there'll still be a very interesting story, but you killed your objective, so everything else will kind of refit itself to make it so you have a, 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 an interest, an interesting objective. But you can shoot anything, and that's kind of the... It, it's it's not always good, and that's one of the lessons we try to teach Brick, is, like, maybe being, like, a, a misogynistic dickbag is probably the worst thing to do. Maybe you shouldn't grab all the ladies and shoot all the bad guys. Maybe maybe the bad guys aren't all the bad guys. It's like maybe just because it's an alien doesn't mean it's bad. Like it's, like I'm trying to secretly slip some, you know, really cool uh, moral ideas in there, but uh, but to I'll, do that, I'll swear much to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much, uh, not even hiding it, but it sounds like you're ready to embrace the fact that your audience, uh, myself included, part of uh, all the people in your audience want to just shoot everybody and, yeah. and be a primitive, you know, guttural Absolutely. douchebag because it's fun and video yeah, games. It should be fun in a game. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, in the game, because you meet us where we're at, which is, yeah, we want to just kill everybody and get all the girls and blah, blah, blah. Then you see the consequences of that right. in a safe, interesting way yeah. uh, in the video game and then play it again to see, well, what if I'm not a douchebag? I wonder what that's exactly. like. I can try yeah. that out. And uh, subtly uh, send that message that maybe being a douchebag uh, doesn't always win or doesn't always pay. That's definitely one of the core tenets. Our replayability is a huge thing, so so we, we do encourage you to shoot the shit out of everything, at least yeah. once. Because then you'll see that it's totally <laughs> different than if you're, like, not a jerk the whole time. Uh, and the, 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 the goal is only 1,000... Uh, no, not 1,000. 160,000, no. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Some um, zeros in there. But that is a pretty... Considering the ambition and just the beauty yeah. of the, the artwork, the, the amazing... Mm -hmm. Soundtrack, you mentioned Bert Kaufman. There's tons of people on the soundtrack. Already. 22, yeah. Yeah, wow. How are you going to pull this off at that budget uh, without making a Sierra helpline to, to help? Right. No, uh, so we're not asking for the entire budget. $160,000 is not the entire budget of, of the game, obviously, from what you're saying. Uh, not only not only do we have all those, uh, those, those music, uh, music artists and our in-house composer, Alex Maher, who is incredibly famous and cool, uh, we, we also have... It's entirely voiced by actors from film, TV, and other games. Um, one of them that I can announce, I'm contractually not obligated not to announce a bunch of them because of Hollywood and all that other stuff, but one of them I can announce is Elspeth, East Elspeth Eastman, who you'll know from other games. She's really cool. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, we, we've got a fully voiced cast, which is pretty neat. Uh, the, it, I'm augmenting the cost. I have a film company as well, and uh, we're, we, we make video game-related uh, film stuff, uh, and hopefully we can balance the two. We've already dumped a bunch of our own money into it. Um, everybody on the team is working for peanuts, man. We're working for like rent money, and that's that's another thing. And we're willing to. That's that's like that's the indie life, right? As we want to make a game, not make a million. I'd love to make a million so that I can make more games. Like that's if if I can spin that. But um, I used to be a, a, an enterprise programmer. I used to program uh, giant data backend stuff for marketing companies in Chicago and, and just lots of big stuff. If, you, if you've ever opened up a Coke bottle and saw a little code underneath, I had something to do with that code. Like, I had all the money. I had, like, the TVs and the penthouse and all the other. It was the worst. I wanted to die. I hated it. I, and I had that one of the sort of epiphany, like, when you're super poor, I grew up in Detroit. When you're super poor, when you're a kid, you think, oh, if I have a car, if I have it, that will be the end. But if you have something in you, the sort of creative spark that needs to make something, having all this stuff will never satisfy. Having all the money will never satisfy. Mo money, mo problems. That's that's wisdom. Um, so I quit the programming thing and started a film and, and media company uh, in 2010. I just lit everything on fire and cashed in the uh, 401k at a 75% loss and made a movie, which is the best way to dump all of your money into a big black hole. And that was uh, motivational growth? That was motivational growth, yeah. Got so... We did that and then started work immediately getting into games. I actually stole some money from Motivational Growth uh, to make a part of Star Mazer. Uh, we, had, we had, okay, so the main character in Motivational Growth, Ian, goes into his television a bunch. That's kind of one of the, the main things that the, the film. And we had all these different TV shows. We had to shoot little segments of television shows, uh, little 90s, like really crappy television shows. One of them was called El Demonio Que Hace Trofios de los Hombres. Uh, it, was, it was, by the way, film nerds among you will know that I actually stole that line from Predator. It's where, it's where the lady goes, Anna goes, she goes, El Demonio Que Hace Trofios de los Hombres means the demon who makes trophies of man. <laughs> and so I, I created a, like a Mexican melodrama, like a Telemundo show called, like a telenovela, El Demonio Que trofeos de los hombres, and um, the idea was that it would be like a woman who's like dating two guys, and our main character would pop in and be like the third guy, and it'd be like a weird thing. Um, but I stole the money. Uh, it's my money. It's the budget for the film, and I, it's my company. But I took it and I gave it to an incredible animator and pixel artist, and was like, ah, "This is a game I'm trying to make. Here's a design doc. Here's a script for some scripted sequences. Uh, let's make it." And I paid him. He knew I was going to use it in the movie, and I kind of, and I finally ended up telling the producer that I took the money for El Demonia and put it into the game. And <laughs> eventually, we use that, and the main character travels into Star Mazer in the film. So if you're into, yeah, he, the main character actually goes into the world of Star Mazer for just like. Not not long because that stuff's expensive. But yeah, sure. Went ahead and did that. So um, Star Wars has been there for a long period of time. Um, the we've been building the groundwork to be able to do this professionally and with confidence for more than five years. Now we feel like the shot is there to take it. And we think if our calculations are correct, and I think they're pretty correct, um, if we get the 160 from Kickstarter, we will be able to in April 2016 deliver something, deliver a game, deliver a functional game that people like. We want to support the game over time. Um, people ask me what, what game it's most like, and I say Minecraft. And we were like, what are you, 
What are you talking about? It's nothing like Minecraft. I'm like, well, no, of course not, but the model is. I'm going to give you something, and you're going to love it, but we're building it with a modular story thing in the center, so I can just keep dropping story modules in, and they will have an exponential changing effect on your playthrough the next time you play through. So the gag is um, it's a living beast. We're releasing, we're calling the game itself the first season. And it could be like Firefly. It could be one season. We can never, and everybody will clamor for more. I hope not. I hope it keeps going. But it's, it's called a season just because it's a word, like a marketing term that people seem to like and get. If I just, I don't want to say episode because some company screwed that up. Um, everybody, you know, well, you're never going to come up with the next episode. It's never going to happen. So it's season. It's a thing. It's got modular story bits. Uh, and also because we like the, the pitch to the idea of watching like a season of your favorite television show, uh, only every time you watch it, it's different, which would be cool. Yeah. So it does seem a bit ambitious, as you said, but um, I've been a programmer for other game companies, and I've kind of built my own little library. And one of the things I built with this sort of modular story engine, which is finally coming to its like final life. It's been used in two other games, and but it's, it's just been building, and now I've got a thing. So we don't need to build that. We don't need to build the shmup stuff. We already had our little functioning action engine shmup thing. So what we're building is the ultimate integration of those two things, the media and storytelling that goes around it, and all of the the, the cream. Uh, as they say, like it takes a week to build a game. It takes a year to finish a game, right? So we've already built the game. We need to finish the game. Awesome. Well, that was the longest pitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it wasn't a pitch at all. It was a very detailed, informative explanation, uh, and cool. also just a way of getting to know you as a person, the way you explained it. Uh, one of the things I love about doing the show is um, 100, at least 100% of the time, if not more, uh, you get a feeling for what it's going to be like to play the game yeah. made by this person. So if Sp uh, Star Mazer has half of the energy and uh, spontaneity and sudden, like, well, let's take this risk, let's do it, that you have as a person, uh, I already know it's going to be a thrill ride. That's going well, thank to you. I'm, I'm honored by that. It's also, I'd like to point out very clearly, though, that I am the head. I am the captain of the ship going, go that way very fast, but I've got eight other people pushing very hard to make that ship go. So, yeah, I mean, it will have that. I will yell at these people and go crazy and make sure things happen, but they're all of them talented artists who are actually making the game. Uh, I'm a couple of them have been game. on the show. Miles Tillman, yep, uh, yep. Pistol Jam, he was on the uh -huh. show. Potato Man Seeks a Truth, great yep. game on iOS now. Uh, he's super mathy, and he's doing all of our sort of bullet physics. He's incredible. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. yeah, Dino Run, another mm -hmm. great game by them. Very many good games. And Austin yeah. Montville, who yeah. uh, 2DX they worked on uh, sports ball. And you Correct. made the trailers for a lot of Is that how you ended up working with these guys? Is, with both uh, of them, yeah. Um, well, technically, Pixel Jam, I'd done, done work with Pixel Jam first, uh, and then I did uh, the trailer for Potato Man and the Actology and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, Austin met me to make a trailer for him. And. Uh, that was really fun. It was an incredible moment because our trailers um, are not cheap. I mean, they're no, pretty they're and beautiful. And well, beautiful. your uh, introduction email to me, and uh, thank you for seeking me out, you were like, so sometimes we make money, and sometimes we just do stuff because we love it, and we yeah. make a lot of money, but it looks awesome, and I'm living right. my life because you know, I'm not so, going to look back and think, I wish I had uh, made the sports ball trailer when you had the chance. What a cool yeah, trailer, exactly. too. Yeah, no, yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, I met Austin at a coffee shop, and he we, we had a meeting set up. And we met at a coffee shop, and I was just enraptured by this this guy's uh, absolute devotion to game development. He is a game developer. That's that's what he is. He's not like a guy who's gonna, he's into rock and vinyls and like wearing his hair shaved halfway and like wearing his tight pants and like chilling out and talking about how he's a game. No, he's a game developer. That's all he does. Hey, he lives in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of like I'd like to sometimes sit with him and not have him evaluate the game we're playing and just like shut up and play the game. Like I don't want to. He's a game developer through and through, and he's amazing. Uh, and I sat there across the table from him, and I'm like, you need. If you need a trailer and you think you need this trailer and you think it'll help, I need to make it for you. So he gave me lunch money, and we, <laughs> we worked our asses off and made a really cool trailer. Um, but yeah, from that point, we, we, we had to work very closely because when you're using lunch money and a bunch of other people's borrowed time and your own money and everything, you tend to get to know somebody and you work kind of in the trenches. And he was there when we shot it, and he was making sure we, we, we had all the look right and everything was it fit his idea of his game, um, which is really cool. Game developers are really great to work with for video stuff because they have an idea of what they want. I can execute the idea, but if I'm doing it wrong, they'll tell me. <laughs> that's, that's the greatest. So anyway, I, I saw that he was, he was in it, and I really wanted to work with him a lot. I actually pitched him Star Mazer soon after that. I was like, let's do Star Mazer. And he's like, i got to finish this thing. i got some other stuff to do. And I'm like, okay, dude, but there's going to be a time. I'm going to say, let's do Star Mazer, and we're going to do it. 
and uh, here we are doing it. He's uh, the, he's actually the lead developer on StarMazer. I'm also a developer on StarMazer, uh, but I'm sure he hates it because I'm like like I said, I come from enterprise development, so I want like DLLs and unit tests. And, uh, and he's like, I'm a game developer. I'm gonna type, and then shit's gonna happen. And if it breaks, we'll just fix it. And I'm like, where's the unit tests? Why didn't we make unit tests? Why didn't we run this through a robot that tests it? Like uh, whatever. What an awesome balance, though. You've got your yeah. creative vision plus this uh, background you've had yeah. with just strict... I'm trying to figure out... You know, I, I can't claim to, to know you all that well yet, unfortunately, but hopefully that'll change in time. But as of right now, I'm picturing you being quiet in front of a computer monitor, and I can't. I just can't picture you being like... It's, oh. so, it's so weird. Everybody, Everybody's always like, what do you do at home when you're alone? And honestly, honestly, I, it's the one time I'm actually very quiet. I save it all up. <laughs> all the thoughts, and it's, it's all waiting. It's all waiting. I leave the house, and boom, it's out there. But but during, and she's like, <laughs> you're just coding something. The, yeah, the back coding, end. typing. Yeah. I have music playing. It's I'm actually I'm very suave. I do it in a tub, a, a giant metal tub, bubbles. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I totally believe you. Uh, the background. Great. And then rose, what did you? Did you want oh, the top's full of wine? I'm gonna keep interrupting you. There's a delay, and I love it. I'm gonna just keep using it to interrupt you. Oh, uh, there's bottles and wine, and uh, I'm waiting for you to talk, for you to start talking again. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Did you want to get into filmmaking first or development first? Uh, when you're um, when you're talking when you're a kid, uh, when okay. you're looking out in your future as an adult. So okay, I got you. I, I see what you're saying. So it's not which would I choose to have started first. It's which was the first thing that struck me as a thing. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it. Flip mode is the greatest. Uh, when I was a kid, I was four years old, about four and a half years old, and I saw, I remember the exact moment, the, 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 it was like a lightning bolt. I was watching, I had, okay, so when you're a kid, when you're that young, we've all been that young, so we all kind of remember these moments. Um, everything just kind of happens, like life is just like, the sun comes up, just because it does, there's no physics or anything, just sun. Um, mom makes lunch, that's a thing, like lunch appears, it's that time, there's lunch. Um, there's a box that sits on like a cart or like on the floor or whatever, and you, you, you push a button and like fantasy comes out of it. And like at, at your request, you push the button, the television comes on, and like magic just pours from the TV. That's the cool. That's just how life works. It's just one of those things, like the sun. And I'm watching, uh, and I wanted some, some time. I, I pushed the button, and on came the thing. We were in Detroit, so really close to Canada. So we got Canadian Broadcasting, and there's a Canadian broadcast version of a, a documentary I've learned recently is called from Star Wars to Jedi. I am not a giant Star Wars fan. I'm not against Star Wars. I love Star Wars. I'm really anxious about the new one. But um, I'm not. that doesn't immediately make me the Star Wars fan of all time. But anyways, I was watching this thing, and I, I just saw the Millennium Falcon. I saw Chewbacca. And I'm like, I'm four. I'm like, this is the greatest. I'm going to pour them for Legos, pour the Legos on the ground, just watch Star Wars. They'll be the greatest. This is, this is how the life should be. The sun came up. Mom made lunch. Legos on the ground. Star Wars on the, the fantasy box. Uh, but then all of a sudden, something happened. It cut. And some, like, old white guy is talking. And then, like, some lady is walking out with a coffee and having a conversation. I'm like, this is not in Star Wars. What's Star Wars? I'm like, I'm trying to build a thing. I can't eat Star Wars. And then it would cut to um, this warehouse where there's a bunch of, like, hippie dudes with beards and smoking cigarettes and running around this big warehouse. And I was like, I don't, this is not what I want. I was about to cry and something happened. I, one of the people put on one of the Gamorrean guard bodies. They, we, they, I was watching the making of Star Wars. Oh, uh -huh. I had no idea. I was a little kid. Uh, yeah. And something in my brain clicked. Oh my God, that's. Star Wars doesn't just. Somebody had to make it. You imagine what that means now in my little brain. Somebody had to make the sun. Like so, something had to. So there was a there was a formative like agency that did a thing, and it's Star Wars was made by people, and I'm, I'm a people. I could make <laughs> I could make Star Wars, right now, and I instantly knew that. For the rest of my life, I had to make something. I didn't. There was no such thing as a writer or a director or like the guy who like gets appointments and babes because he's a film director. None of that. I didn't, all I knew was there was like 17 people in a big warehouse creating something. So my entire life, I've been like searching for. Um, you do this thing where you, you like you ramp up with your kid and you like stack up all your ideas and all of your life, and then you get like 25, and you're just pushing and you're trying to do all this stuff and experience all the things and go on all the roller coasters, and travel all over the world, and everything. You hit this one point where you like kind of plateau for a minute, and you're like, "What does it all mean?" And then you spend like the rest of your life trying to get back to the part that you like ruined by doing all this shit in the middle, right? And so um, I've always, my entire life has been about trying to get to that moment, that one classical moment that I saw on television when I was four and, a, four and a half, a bunch of people together making a thing, creating a thing, making something beautiful that didn't exist and couldn't exist without the abstraction of like human art. Like that is, 
that's my dream. Uh, film is a really, really incredible way to do it. Uh, but as a writer-director, I actually don't participate as much as I'd like. Mm. I, uh, I, I get to, to establish a thing, build a property, and watch, a, watch 20 to 30 to 200 artists do the thing I saw on television. I'm effectively, back at, I'm effectively back at being four years old watching it happen in front of me. Yeah, they come and ask me, what do you think of this color and what do you think of that or how do you want to set up the camera? But I'm not engaged the way they are. I'm not bleeding in it. You know, they're, I'm bleeding as much as I because i got to manage 60 different departments, but I'm not, I'm not like with my hands sculpting the thing. And so it's, I kind of have it in film, but with games... Um, if you're not in indie games, at least I'm not sure about how games work at big studios. But if you're not scrappy, you don't you don't have your fingers in it at all times. It, it'll you, you'll lose track of it. Uh, it it's not as cohesive. Uh, it, it's a newer art. Uh, film has been around for a long time, and and the the structure that film is based on the mi sort of military sort of group management structure that's been around for around for a long time. And everybody has their columns that they kind of stick with, and we have cross pollination of those po columns at, at certain very registered times. Indie game development is super scrappy. I get to be in there. I get to do. I get to sit in a room with four, 14 people and press the launch Kickstarter button and watch my dreams kind of like either explode or fizzle. Like that's the moment I'm looking for to have all these artists together working together and to be part of something beautiful and with the, with the whole end goal of all time of all of these different things to tell stories. And that's, I mean, that's the human condition. We tell stories no matter what. You go to Bosnia, they're telling stories. You go to India, they're telling stories. You go to France, they're telling stories. That's what human beings do. So I don't know if there is, uh, it, it's, not, it, it's not the noblest of pursuits maybe, or maybe, it, I don't know, but it is a noble pursuit. Um, it, when people don't have any money, they sit around and tell stories. When people need help, they, they watch stories. When people uh, are depressed, they look at stories. When people are happy, they, they, they use that happiness to, to engage themselves in the stories. It's, what we, it's like the human condition. It's our, we have the ability to abstract, and that's the only, I mean, that's the only thing that keeps us from like, everything else. And we, it keeps us in such a huge distance, at such a huge distance from everything else. Um, look, a beaver can make a dam. Uh, it takes existing stuff and it's one level of, of, of abstraction. It says, I need to take that and put it here, and it does it. It does a really cool dam. It's really nice. Um, <clears throat> outside of chemical, biological things like bees and beeswax, there's nothing that intelligently says, other than us, uh, I can take an, a concept and craft that concept out of something that has nothing to do with that concept. Uh, and I can take that further. We have infinite abstraction. A game is nothing but abstraction. I work with people who do nothing. I think an alien intelligence, an alien intelligence with only like a physical understanding of the universe would just look at our room and be like, their job is to pound on things. They just pound on things all day. Yeah, pressing but, buttons, looking yeah, at things. Yeah, looking at things. Their eyes are moving. Nothing else is moving. Yeah. Exactly. Out of that comes a beautiful abstraction. And I think that that is what storytelling and game making, there's this constant weird like, well, I'm a filmmaker, well, I'm a game maker, well, one day we will work very hard and put the two together. They're all ready together, motherfucker. We just, we, we, it's, it's, it's where you put the agency in those. In, in a film, I want, I want my agency to remain with me. I want to watch a thing. In, um, I'm sorry, I want my agency to remain on the screen. I want to watch mm -hmm. a thing happen. In games, I want the agency to remain with me. I want to control the events. I don't want to play aliens. It, it, it's, it's cool when you get to play aliens, unless it's colonial marines. Um, it's, it's really fun, but that doesn't change aliens. We're hearkening back to a thing that we enjoyed watching. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think that, that uh, films and games need to converge. I do think transmedia is a huge idea. Telling a story over multiple media is incredible, and I love that idea, but it's still just telling stories. The whole thing is telling stories. Uh, everybody from, the, 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 from, from Peter Molyneux all the way to Jonathan Blow, even though those two guys seem diametrically opposed in vision, they both want to tell stories in the end, right? Mm -hmm. I'm... I'm with them. I'm also with you. I'm also with everybody else who wants to sit down and tell some stories. Uh, I just, I know that I, a programmer plus storyteller equals video game. I got that. I got a bunch of artists and friends. We can, we can do it, and we do it really well. So that's kind of the arc of it. Sorry that I went off on a tangent. Not at all. Well, I'm, <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's your job. As long as you keep yeah. going on the tangents, you can feel like you did a great job on the show. So excellent cool. work. Well, then I'm winning. I get all the points. Every <laughs> coin. So far. Um, the, the, the transmedia, was that, part of, did, did that, was that part of the intention, or did it just naturally happen that Star Wars it, has shoot 'em up elements and also more passive sitting and watching uh, the, the, the uh, effect of the things you decide to do uh, point and click is a lot of just watching what happens yeah. after you clicked. You know, you're no, totally. Uh, 
Yeah, more where a shoot 'em up is pretty much nonstop. You need to be present in this moment, or else you might get hurt, get killed, whatnot. So. I, I think transmedia is a dangerous term. Um, okay, I use okay. it all the time. No, 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 say it because I say it all the time. It's the way, it's the thing that we all know. It's like the uh, descriptivism versus versus prescript, prescriptivism thing. I might say something stupid that I don't actually know the idea of, but you know it, so you get it. Um, uh, transmedia is is a response to something that we haven't kind of gotten our minds around, which is that there is no separation of media. Like uh, we, we like to make the separation because if somebody's a really good guitarist and a real really shit programmer, he can uh -huh. be really good at the thing. Uh -huh. so that lets him mean, be really good. But no, no, it, it's. I think we all just share media and all. Okay, action, reaction, inaction. Those are all part of action. It's all like the thing. Um, you you can't take something and it's negative and call those separate things. They're just one is a thing and the other is it's opposite. It's part of the same coin. Um, so I, I think it all starts with the idea of convergence of those things. Not transmedia convergence in making films that are also games, but um, actual convergence of the idea of media. So like you said, uh, action and adventure, uh, point and click adventure, and, and shmup action. When I was a kid, that was a, a big gulf between my two favorite game types. I loved the shmups, the shoot 'em ups a lot, so much. But I also wanted to tell, yeah, I wanted to hear a story outside of aliens done, showed up, showed them, like that. I wanted to hear something else. I wanted to know something else. And even games like Lords of Thunder, which is an incredible, probably one of the best shoot 'em ups ever made, you have all this cool armor and all these like weird, there's no effing story that I can tell. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's beautiful, but the story is uh, there are five bad dudes. They turn in a mod, shoot them, shoot them! Like, that's it. <laughs> um, whereas with uh, Point and Click, it's a lot of, like, listening to Tim Curry do a horrendous New Orleans accent for, like, seven hours. <laughs> and I, at some point, like, you, you can get 40 minutes in, and you're like, cool, I'd love to shoot a thing, or I'd love to do something with in initial, or, I'm sorry, immediate uh, consequences to my initial impact. Uh, so yeah, no, I think bringing those two things together is important. And and I picked the two. I didn't pick them because they're diametrically opposed. Uh, some people like you picked the two, like most opposed. I, I don't think that's even the case. Uh, mm. But I did pick the two things that I love the most. And I think I love them the most because they are ultimate expressions of action and storytelling. One is mostly just like like a choose your own adventure movie, mm. animated. The other one is. It's twitch, 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 like things are blowing up constantly. I want to put those, and I want to find the median. I want to fix the problems I, I had as a kid with both of those, and I want to put them put them together in a really nice thing. Uh, uh, a lot of people ask, like, well, how much is shmup and how much is shoot it, or how much is point and click? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to say PNC and shmup a lot. Uh, P-N-C-A-S-H-M-U-P, pink and shmup. We made that up. It sounds stupid, but that's our game. Not stupid, but the word. Um, uh, we also use an OMG system, o Open Middle Gameplay, OMG, exclamation point. The exclamation point is part of the registered trademark that we have not registered. Uh, I, I want to take, uh, I, I, want, I want the game to live around you. Like I said, it's, a lot of the stuff's procedurally generated, and uh, you get to choose to go to your Star Wolf, your ship, anytime you want. Uh, you, can, you can chill out at the bar and figure out quests and puzzles and all that all you want, but once you get in that, sh that Star Wolf, we don't cut to a thing. There's no loading screen. It doesn't jump to space shooter. We actually try to sew these things together in so much as while you get in, you have to pilot the ship out and the camera's pulling back. And if, if you land again, the camera goes back in. And the UIs actually don't change. One of the UIs just shrinks into the other UI. So your point and click UI shrinks down and becomes part of the shmup UI, one of the readouts in the, the shmup UI. Uh, and so it's a seamless integration of those two, two play styles. Um, and they're play styles, they're not genres in our game. Uh, the, the point and click is more actioning. You, you know what you're supposed to be clicking on. You have to choose immediately what you want to do, how you want to click on it, as opposed to, like, what am I supposed to click? Um, and the shmup actually has point and click elements. Uh, one of the bosses that we created, which you can, if you go to our dev blog, you can also, we update our dev blog, like, eight times a day. It's, well, we're at PAX, it's just a bunch of pictures of us at PAX. But normally it's, it's us, we'll do uh, videos. I have a guy, part of my team, whose job is to learn from us. He's basically... Uh, a social media guy, and all he does is like post constantly what we're doing. And we've we've written, we've all signed a thing that says he can film anything. So all day long he's posting what we're doing. We're being to totally transparent about it. Uh, you can watch us build a guy. One of the guys we built recently is a boss that you have to actually like communicate with in a point and click manner, combine things, and have a conversation with. You're in the shmup section and you're flying, and he's like charging up, and he's like, you know, like you'll never survive, Mazer, and you gotta like talk your way out of the scenario or talk your way into a terrible battle. 
we 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 get chocolate in your peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a it's a Reese's peanut butter cup. You don't combine when somebody's like give me a Reese's. They're not saying give me a small piece of of milk chocolate combined in, you know, in in, in opposition to a piece of peanut butter. That's no, no, no. It's its own thing with its own branding, its own like little flares around the edges, and it you when you eat a Reese's peanut butter cup, you have a certain way you eat it, and it all you like the the ridgy bits and the middle bits and all that. That's it's all. One thing, one unit. Yes, it's two opposed elements, but they've combined to make one cohesive thing. And that's that's what Star Mazer is. It's a cohesive unit. We're making a new genre. I don't want to be like, we're blazing a trail. But no, we're doing a thing, and it turns out the thing doesn't exist the way we want to do it before. So I guess technically, yeah, we're blazing a trail. We're changing everything. We're, it's a religious experience. It's the best. There's nothing better. I'm kidding, obviously. <laughs> Somebody's well, gonna clip. Somebody's gonna clip just that part out and just loop it. It's gonna be on a vine. It's gonna be. I want to do that. That's it's that, the best. That's Star Mazer is the. It's gonna change all of the world. It's the best. No, it's it's gonna be fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be well for me, and I feel like it, it's not necessarily game design just for me, but it's designed for people who. Uh, well, no, that's not right either. Uh, I, it's gonna shame. Old games, I think, in the, much of the way Shovel Knight did. We talked about Shovel Knight earlier. People like you and I are like, oh my god, this is how I remembered old games yeah. being, but when you actually go back and play those games, they're not as smartly designed. They don't throw in little mini-bosses. Like, when you go back and play uh, Legend of Zelda 2, you always wish, like, wouldn't it be cool if something actually happened in the town? And then they, <laughs> they thought that too, so then they make like, I am a, a hat salesman boss. Yeah, I yeah. Am yeah. Happens. That's it. But then he, like, fights you or something. That would have been <laughs> Shovel yeah. Knight, uh, Yacht Club games, they knew that. And, yeah. But for people who never played NES games, they love Shovel Knight too, and then they go back and play like Faxanadu or something, and they're like, Jesus Christ, how did you put up with this? This is so yeah. much worse than yeah, yeah. Shovel Knight. Uh, I, don't, I think you're going to spoil people for a lot of shoot 'em ups and for point and click if, if your plan comes together, because yeah. to be able to blend all of that stuff when you play a shoot 'em up, like you were saying, you so often are like, well, I want to know more about this world, and they never yeah. get to that. Or so you're playing a point. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's a. I'm, I'm so. I, I realized you're going to do just the, the the posing of that, and I want to do that with you. There, there, there's a there's a thing uh, we, for the point and clicks specifically. Uh, we went back and played. Oh my god! Thank you, GOG.com. We went back and played everything, man. And there, there's. It's super easy to shit on something. It's super easy to say Police Quest is so obtuse. It's mm. insane. Um, it, it is now. We, we we do this thing as human beings. Like we live three years in the past and three years in the future. Like we, we expect only three years and we live only three. We live in also a, it's a rule of threes. I'm making this up as I go along. We only kind of live in our little three little three foot circle. Uh, we have three best friends. Wow. I'm I'm gonna write a book. No. So <laughs> check it out. Uh, it seems like uh, when you go play something like Police Quest. It is obtuse and it's hard and it looks kind of crappy and man, why why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they? That I think when you take that into account, or I'm sorry, if you, when you say that you don't take into account, they like well, why don't you go back to the Middle Ages and say like why didn't they just use Google? Well, it didn't exist. Like the <laughs> concepts didn't exist. Um, Police Quest is a stepping stone, a, a rung on a ladder, and, and and at one point it was the top rung of the ladder, and, but you learn from that, and Police Quest 2, and then SWAT, and all these other things come out, and we just learn and learn and learn and learn. I mean, point and click adventures are still being made. They're being made totally differently uh, because the industry kind of went away. Uh, I actually think that we could learn from, instead of, like, dismissing the old ones, we could actually evolve them uh, the, to, toward a silo that they could go into, um, which, which is what we're trying to do, but I think that we, we, we can, it's so easy to dismiss. Like, at the time, Phantasmagoria 2 was the hottest shit. I remember. It was the hottest shit. You try to play that game now, it's fucking, the acting is horrendous. Everything is shit. When you were 14, your pants were half down. Like, that was the thing you did. Like, it is <laughs> worth it. Because, again, it, that built on Police Quest, which built on Zork, which it's built it, on... Yeah. But um, I think at the time, we, it, it's super easy to go look at those things and say, oh, they're shit, and say, I could do better. Well, of course you could do better. You grew up in a world where, like, everything was already better, and it was only better because those things were amazing at the time. So what absolutely. we're going to try to do is take all the, the amazing bits and stick them together with, the, with all the other cool stuff that we have in our environment now, and not jettison all the other stuff, but learn from it. I mean, uh... I think that's the only way to do it, and I think uh, shaming the old stuff is, is, I get your concept, but I think that it's a bit rough, because it'd be really, really hard for me to shame um, King, any of the King's Quest series, although it, 
Sometimes it's that oh, owl, I'm going to fucking kill that owl, man. But, <laughs> well, I, think, I love all those games, but I'm guessing yeah. you know, 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds. Right. That's who I think is going to be spoiled for King's Quest. They're not going to be able to yeah. go back. In the same way, they can't go back and watch Buck Rogers, which I can still watch, and be like, yeah. oh, if it weren't for Buck Rogers, we might not have had, you know, X, Y, and Z. We might not have had Total Recall. We might not have totally, had all these yeah. fish out of water, sci-fi things. Uh, but it's a corny show with a little robot that I'm still figuring out. Is it Twiggy or Tweaky? Like they, they changed I it. always thought it was Twiggy. Yeah, because I swear to God, the doctor sometimes is like, "Come here, Tweaky." And beady, beady, beady. Weird. I love that little guy. Anyway, Weird. I keep about that. Uh, yeah, so you're not spoiling it for me, but you are spoiling it. You're making point-and-click games uh, pre-1994 worse for all the kids today. But I think I think those kids, those kids have the same. They'll have the same idea about those games. Um, whether or not Star Maze is a huge success, I think that they, they live in a world where it wasn't novel. It's not uh, novel, and I yeah. think I think we need to do something novel with those tools, and mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're trying to do. We will, it will, it will call back a billion to to it'll it'll come from in here deep down. The little four-year-old is going to the thirteen-year-old. That's all those little moments are going to come out onto the game, but it needs to be accessible. It needs to be commercial. And I, I'm not saying that from, like, I need to make money from a standpoint, but I want people to be able to enjoy it. What's the point of telling a story if you're telling it in a, in a locked room, a soundproof room by yourself? I want I want the people to get it. I want people to have a good time. So we, we are calling back, and, yeah, maybe maybe it'll put stuff to shame. I think the, old, the closest thing you could do in my mind to doing that is to alert people that point and click is, like, a thing that maybe they didn't know about, which I don't know how they wouldn't with like Telltale and whatever. But they super uh, don't know. It's it's weird. Yeah. Like, uh, there's a, they know Walking Dead, but yeah. when, when I tell them all Maniac Mansion, if it weren't for uh, uh, yeah. Maniac Mansion, we wouldn't have. Why we had Ron Gilbert on the show recently. Yeah. He's working on a point and click, which yep. like you're doing. He's trying to recall. Well, this is how it felt when you played yeah. Maniac games. But yeah, I mean, totally. And, and when he said that, and I was working on Star Maze, I was very worried because. How am I supposed to beat that? I can't, I, I'll do my best. Um, I think we will be partners. I think we will be parallel to one another. Um, but no, I, I totally think, that just putting this out there on this particular topic, uh, you can't actually shame um, Maniac Mansion or Day of the Tentacle. I don't, I, those, are, those are games that were like lightning strikes in the, mm. like, the universe, like intelligent universe. There are things like that. There are, I, I, I hate to say this. Anybody who knows me will know that this is like ripping my soul apart to say this, but I know that there are football plays. That, that could only happen the one time. You know what I mean? Like, that's, I don't even, I know nothing about football. That's the one with the bat, right? I did sense. But I know that there are football plays that can only happen one time. And everything, there's that moment. There are some acting performances that just, that everything aligned and made it do it. Uh, there are entire films like that. I think uh, both, this is twice in one, both Maniac Mansion and Day of the Tentacle. Those are, I, I believe, and maybe it's my, my nostalgia, but I know, I know 20 year olds who played through those things. Those are, Oh, sure. they put them on the NES, which the interface was dicks. But uh, if you played this on PC, you're, those are seminal. They created a, a thing. If you go to our Kickstarter page right now, we actually have uh, two of the data. They are the tentacle tentacles in our budget breakdown. Oh yeah. We hope we don't get sued for that. But um, well, no, if you, uh, I, I sort of know Ron Gilbert. I've been meaning to email ah, him actually. Well, we interviewed mm. him before the show, and we we sure. tried. To big deal out of it, and then shortly after that, uh, he did the uh, Thimbleweed Park Kickstarter. We interviewed him for that, so mm -hmm. we've shown our love for him, and I told him I was going to voice act for a show for our for his game for for free if he wants. I voice act uh, for your game for free, too. I can do a very really? good old man. I can do a, a, a Japanese, like, sensei who's, uh, or a Japanese old woman. I do that fairly oh, well. Oh, nice. I do good, what old good. I can do. So we'll, well, we'll old is your thing. <laughs> yeah. For, oh, for, the, for the low, low price of maybe the next two days, I can sound like this. <laughs> yeah, you've got to, you got to capture, speaking of convergence, this yeah. is the time you got to grab this the lightning in the bottle. This is the moment. I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff, and I'll, I'll pull it from YouTube later. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to be Judge Dredd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna. I'll rip that from YouTube later. It'll be in the game. <laughs> really, I had to bite my tongue to not laugh over that because you need to. Get <laughs> I need little, it clean. It's got to be yeah, clean. Yeah, try to make sure it was clean. Uh, but yeah, I know Ron Gilbert a little bit. Who knows? Cool. Maybe you guys will even do a crossover. I'll, that I'll would be. That interview. would be. I mean, look, you already know. If you go to our Kickstarter, you already know. You, I don't want to name. I don't want to say any names. I will say we've got the original composer and sound designer of Mega Man. Mm. Did, you, did you see my lanyard? It's a Mega Man lanyard. It's also a shovel light, but um, it's a yeah. Mega Man lanyard. I, Mega Man, ask my mom, dude. I've been that. Oh, uh, what? I called my mom. I texted my mom. I texted, we're in. We're in the future. I text my mom now. Fuck a phone call. I, but I, I, I 
I texted my mom. I had a tear in my eye. Like she's gonna do, she's gonna do my game. Um, the proto men on the other side of the spectrum are also doing the game. So I'm huge into that. Um, but I had these these like sort of pillars, right? Ron Gilbert, one of the pillars. And so said, yeah, make it happen, John, make it happen. I'll do my best. You, I'll give you a part in the game. You make it happen. All saying. right, that's Done. not weird. That's not, and I'll never be able to review the game now. And destructoid, everyone's gonna oh. think maybe we colluded hard. You're fired. I had to fire you. You can't do it. <laughs> I need it front page or it sucks. I can't. It's it's been up to twice. I need like the fourth and fifth. I need those things. We'll make that third interview. I need our third third thing. I need I need a fourth and a fifth, and the fifth needs to be get it now. It's the last week of the Kickstarter. Get it over shutting the site down. We're gonna murder kid twice and then shut the site down and then leave the country. Get Star Mazer. Back it on Kickstarter. Fifteen percent or twenty five percent discount at fifteen dollars. Get it now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Instead of done, then I'll do the voice acting. Yeah, yeah. So, after, after. Yeah. Right. We we have we have a year of development, man. Get get me Ron Gilbert. That'll be cool. Then you can do the the, get, do the Kickstarter post, and then I'll hire you. It's done. Ron it's Gilbert, done. the post. Then I get fired from Destructoid. Then you still let me voice the the uh, old Japanese woman in your game. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. But, but think about it. just just weigh it. There's like. And head in his dark night. and then like old lady voice and came this one time. That that is life goals. You have to prioritize. Don't fall for the bullshit. <laughs> uh, good life advice. Uh, if yeah. people take anything away from this episode, it should be uh -huh. prioritize being the old Japanese woman in something. If you can, if you can do it, I can't. I can just be. I can just be Marcus Phoenix. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> In my head, it sounds like Marcus Phoenix. I don't know. On the outside, it might sound like Donald Duck, but in my head. <laughs> Close the e -hole. What the hell is an e-hole? Why would we say e -hole? Who wrote e-hole? And why did Tabasio look at that and go, oh, yeah, I'll say e-hole a lot. It makes sense. Put it in the e-hole. Blow, <laughs> blow it up. Blow up the e-hole. Blow it in the e-hole. It's coming out of the e-hole. Like, why is that a thing in real life that happens? In a very Cures popular War. video game, if I remember correctly. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I love Cures of War. This, it's the greatest. It's the best. Dom is the coolest character ever. I love that they had to replace a word with the word assholes uh, in, in the first one. And so there's all these really weird, really, really terrible, sorry whoever wrote that, I don't know, but really terrible, like, super, like, homophobic statements that have been changed with the word asshole. Those two guys look like a couple of assholes. Like, what? <laughs> what? Why, why? First, why write that line? Second, why not just, re re if you're going to be in the booth already, mm. why not record something not terrible? <laughs> something not horrendous? Well, as you know, I, I don't know. Uh, you, your films have been relatively large in scale, but you've yeah. had a pretty small team yeah. When you've done them, but as you, you know, the more people that get involved, the, the harder it can be to make these decisions uh, unaffected by outside variables. Yeah, no, totally, but I'm on the outside, and that's the cool part. That's the cool part of being on the outside. I, my movie has been reviewed, like, hundreds of times, and there, some of them are really cool, and some of them are really thoughtful, like, I wish it was more like this, and uh, cool, I'll take that, and I'll make a better movie next time. But some of them, man, just like, the movie's dumb, I hate it, it's dumb, it's stupid, fuck it, it's the dumbest movie, I have no stars, zero, a hundred, negative, hundred stars. You, there's, you get that. You get to do that, I guess, as a human being. So fuck it. No, it was the worst. I don't know why they didn't just fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can't help but uh, but uh, wonder, like, why yeah. didn't you just fit this to my vision? Why did you yeah, accidentally fit your own vision? I had a vision, and you had all the money. Microsoft was behind you. Why didn't you just do it? Like, I totally get that. As a filmmaker, I love that. Like, why didn't you just? It's like, shut up, man. It cost. It cost every minute was like. Just cars disappearing, and you, you want me to like do something magical for you? I can't. I'm sorry. I get it. But, well, isn't but, it great that they're that invested in? Because uh, that happens to me fairly regularly. I've been doing much more videos for Destructo.com of late. Sure. And some of the nicest compliments I've gotten from people is like, that video was almost good. If yeah. you had just done this, I would have loved it. I'm like, you were invested enough in this like stupid world I made up about me being Sagat from Street Fighter having a conversation with uh, Samus from yeah. Metroid. Someone yeah. was so invested in it, they're like, why weren't you wearing high heels? Yeah. That would have been yeah, hilarious. And I'm like, you, you cared enough to, to yell at me? Thank I'm so you. with you. That my film Motivational Growth is effectively, it's a two-man cast. I mean, there's a bunch of characters in it, but they come in and out. The main There's a main character played by a guy named Adrian DiGiovanni. He's incredible. Uh, and then Jeffrey Combs, Star Trek's Jeffrey Combs, the reanimator's Jeffrey Combs, uh, Peter Jackson's The Frighteners' Jeffrey Combs. Uh, he, he's in it. 
He he plays a giant chunk of talking fungus. It's an animatronic puppet. It's incredible. He does he does. Man, I'm so blessed. I mean blessed as a, like I got a thing from a guy. I don't mean blessed as any sort of secular or non secular or whatever. Disclaimer, yeah. disclaimer, disclaimer. Shut down the site. Oh my god. Um, but I was lucky, super lucky to get this dude. And um, uh, people will watch the whole movie, and they'll come to me and they'll be like, "Well, I thought the uh, the performance of the delivery girl." Could have been a little better. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I they notice that, that Jeffrey Combs was a fungus in your right, film? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and or my favorite, my personal favorite, I love it. It uh, it sags just a little in the third act. And I'm like, it's a movie about a guy talking to a chunk of fungus. You didn't say the fungus sucked. I won. I won the internet. I got all the monies. Look what I did. I all the coins belong to me. I. You didn't say. The the the, the rubber puppet. With Jeffrey Combs' voice wasn't silly. Uh, I mean, yeah, they, they bought silly. that part. They yeah. were sold on that. Yeah. They, they bought they bought the puppet. That was ninety percent of the film. They didn't buy the the middle. You could have used. You could have cut four or five minutes out. Like, well, okay. But do you remember that part with the puppet though? That was the whole movie. You like that? Just I win. I'm done. Drop the mic. Well, yeah, yeah they, you got them invested enough in what you made that they want to create it along with you yeah. in retrospect. They and that's really they, cool. Yeah, yeah. One of the coolest feedback, feedback I always got was, um, and this was really neat because remember, we're going to go back to the beginning of our conversation. I stole a little bit of that money, made a bit of Star Mazer. Right. right? And I have a design doc. I worked with Miles, actually, on the design doc. It's by Miles and I, uh, Miles Tillman. Um, we, we kinda, and this was years ago. And we, we kind of got this already. Um, and I would show the show at festivals. I'd get up and I'd say, Okay, um, I'd, I'd ask who loved it, I'd ask who hated it, and ask what's your favorite part. It'd be like, who loved it? Uh, between 60 and 80% of the audience. Who hated it? Every woman over 40. And, uh, <laughs> and I would ask, uh, what did you like the most about it? 50-50 split between Jeff Combs, the giant chocolate talking fungus, and that fucking video game. How can I buy that video game? Can I give you some money? Get the video game. Oh, and I want the video game. Yeah, Star Amazing. Really? So, at that point, I was like, yes, so I, it, was, it was a good investment. We should make this game. But I can't just, like, think, oh, I did a thing. I should definitely make it. What am I – okay, so I've got this little theory. It's not really a theory. It's just, like, a life thing that I've kind of worked out in my life. Um, there are two – whenever you hear somebody say there are two groups of people, that person's a jerk. And I'm sorry I'm going to be a jerk. But um, it seems like Western society can kind of be, like, really divided into these two, like, sets. Everything else, everybody's unique butterflies. It's great. But, but two sides either, of the same coin, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Two sides of the same coin. Sounds very good when I say that. Yeah, two kinds. The human condition is bi bifurcated. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got these two sides. One of them are people who wanna who, who wanna be a thing, right? I want to be famous. I want to be an actor. I want to be a game developer. I want to be a musician. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon. I want to be a lawyer. Uh, and then there are people who are like, I can't live without making music. I can't live without making a game. I, Austin Montville would just, you put him in a room and give him a, a set a deck of cards, he would make a brand new game out of the deck of cards. He has to make games or he will die. Just like a fucking plant needs a son, he needs to make games. Um, he doesn't come to me and say, by the way, I'm a game developer, Austin Montville, who's, you know, I'm super into this game, this genre, that genre. He doesn't talk it. He doesn't. I mean, he'll talk it in a game development, like, conference, but in real life, he's, he's a dude. He's a dude who needs to make a game. Um, there are people who want to be game developers, and there are people who want to make games or they will die. Um, those are different things, completely different things. You can't, it's not that you can't want to be a game maker, as, as long as you, you need to do it or you'll die. Uh, the same with being a filmmaker or a writer or a surgeon or a lawyer. Imagine, like, wanting to be a surgeon because you can get blow in Ferraris and you have to, like, deal with people's hearts every day. That's the worst idea. Um, and there's, there's a bonus that comes along with it. So I, in my weird world, by the way, uh, I am H-O, disclaimer, destructoid. These are not the views of destructoid, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, these people over here, the guys who, who, who need to do it or they'll die, those are like human beings trying to, to like change the world. These people are jerks and assholes. They're hipsters, and I hate them. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. But like, there's a trick. There's a magical trick. If you, uh -huh. if you make games... If you wake up every day and you make a game and it's the worst game and you fail it and you work the next day, you make another game or in the next week or next year, you make another game and you fail miserably. It's the worst game ever. And you keep trying and every time you're let down you try harder and you do it and you do it and you do it and all of a sudden you're an amazing well-known game maker. You did it and by default you get to be it. Yeah. The best, the best way to be a thing is to do the thing for real. 
But to be honest about it and really do it, I in the filmmaking community, any filmmaking community, you meet a bunch of people who are just, oh, yeah, I'm a writer, director, producer, actor, sound designer, whatever. And they're not. They're just people who like want to do it. They want to be it, rather. They don't want to spend the time and investment. I've had people come to me and be like, it's just pretty, like, reaching 12 hours now. It's pretty hard. I'm like, you're acting for a living. Did, is this 12 hours? Fuck 12 hours. Work 30 more hours. Like, do it. Do it until you can't do it because you woke up this morning and needed to do it or you would die. That is somebody who will inevitably be it. You can't not be it if you do it your entire life. If you mm. just want to be it, you're missing out on all the stuff that makes it so you want to be it. Even if you convince 500,000 people that you are it, the minute you're pressed to do it, you're going to fail because you never did it. Or you did it kind of half-assed just enough to get the point, just enough to stand there with the fucking artisanal paper wrapped beer and like oh yeah and man just games and unity and words and like that's the worst i'm sorry i just went on a big old rant <laughs> no it's great it's psychology i've been like yelling at people for three days so you like I, i'm impressed i was a little concerned that you would be low energy <laughs> never <laughs> that's, not, that's not happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, Look, i was no, born no, premature no. i came out I, I was like i'm 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 done with the waiting now let's come on <laughs> Out. Let's do a thing, Mom. Let's go. We're going to make a thing happen. <laughs> well, that speaks to this uh, frustration that you have with people who are more focused on their identity and, and who they seem to be. Yeah, and it's, just, it's, not, it's not that they're, like, trying to, to look away. Look away. I have, like, 50 pairs of shoes, man. I want you to look at my shoes. Oh, those are cool shoes. But I had to make the money and buy the shoes. Like, that's the thing. Um, What I'm saying is the frustrating thing isn't that there is a group of people who want to look like a thing. It's that, like, there's a really easy and consistent way to look like a thing. Do it. Do well, it easy for good. you, sir. But other folks are definitely afraid of doing anything that's going to tarnish their identity and their image. So if they fail once, really, I'm sorry, then I mean, they I, say, oh, I failed, I suck, and now I feel bad about the myself. controversy on your show. I've got to bring it up. If you, the, the fear thing, what are you afraid of? Dying? Going to happen. Beyond that, you have nothing else to fear in life. Like, oh, but the guy, the guy at the mall might think, what, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit what the guy at the mall thinks? Who gives a shit what the guy on the internet thinks? Who gives a shit what the... Ugh, like, check it out. You, How many times in your life have you looked back four years and thought, well, at least that one time I, like, really looked good for, like, 12 seconds? Are you going to lay on your deathbed and go, well, at least I watched every episode of Lost and sounded really educational when I tried to argue that there was a plot point? Like, that doesn't work in life. You're going to die. When you hit, like, 30, at least for me, I hit 30, and then, like, a lightning strike hit me, and I was like, dude, you're, you're going to die, though. Mm. All the other shit, <laughs> you're going to die. You're going to lay there, and your entire life will amount to the things you will have been able to actually create. Those are the only things that will resonate in the universe. The heat birth of the universe happened. The inevitable uh, uh, events of physics have taken place, and it all leads up to you're dead, dude. Because beyond that, you will not know what happened. Except mm. you can live on through actual events. that you, If you saved 500 people's lives that if you think about generations and sex and babies and stuff, you have changed the face of the planet. If you're a surgeon who saved 500 people's lives, you, you, you've changed a race. You've changed the human race. If you talked about one day going to med school, but then flunked out, did a bunch of pot and did nursing school because it was easy. They did it at night and watched a whole bunch of adult swim. By the way, I actually work with adult swim, so I'm not insulting adult swim. But if that's all you did, uh, you didn't do much. I just say I'm not saying I'm great, or right? I'm actually going to be scraping my entire life to try to be something of value before I'm laying there going, well, at least I played a shit ton of Gears of War with the e hole. Like I guess that's that's why I try to make games, man. I want somebody to have an experience with motivational growth. Uh, the movie, it's a secret trick. It's about depression. It's actually about it's funny and weird and wonky and crazy, but it's about a guy who's legitimately depressed. I've, in my life, experienced either through myself or through others a lot of depression, and I, I've made a character who you could relate to because he was thrown into a crazy world. We didn't have to say, "Listen, I'm about to tell you about depression. It's going to make you uncomfortable." No, no, no. I threw it in there so that you could like relate to the guy, but also relate to the guy being weirded out by the giant ch chunky taco fungus or taco chunky fungus. But that was a weird thing I said. Anyway, um. The, the whole point, though, is it, it's secretly about depression. And one time I was at a, a, a festival and a, girl, a woman came up to me and she said, listen, I have had um, severe depression and anxiety my entire life, and your film is the only thing I've ever seen to correctly uh, display what that feels like. Not what it looks like to the outside world, but inside what that feels like. And I want you to know that knowing someone out there knows is impactful. That's all the movie was for. One person, that human being, I'm done. You can say that the, the middle sags a bit. Fuck you. That lady was fixed. That fixed. Helped. That lady knew that there was somebody else out there that 
got it at least a little bit, and mm. that it, I impacted a life. I am, and that's not, I'm not saying I'm great. I I try. It's my first indie film, man. I, I did my best. I uh, I see everything wrong with it, and I'm sure everybody else sees everything wrong with it too. But I think that there's a moment where you see that you've had an impact. Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight was my 2014. I played it. I played it through New Game Plus. I played it on the toilet. I played it in bed. I played it in, on the bus. I played it in my living room. I love that game. That game changed the way I think about things. I contacted the developers immediately. I tried to work with them. I tried to do videos for them. I tried to do everything I could do with these guys because they impacted me. And everything that comes out of my life creatively since then will be impacted by Shovel Knight and 10,000 other things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just like, yeah, Kobe Games. But like all other things. Um, I, I think that to be one of those people, and it's not rare and it's not hard. It is hard if you don't have the energy or the actual will to do it. But it's, if you just put like what you have default in you as a human being, if you just bleed that on the, into the universe, half of the people are going to shit on it immediately and that's fine. That's how you learn try to sway them. But if you put that out there, it will inevitably help things or fix things or change things. And I think, look, there's a, there's a story I always tell. People say, well, why not? Why not? Uh, why aren't you trying to feed everybody? You're trying to change the world. Why aren't you trying to feed everybody? Well, I can't. I have zero idea how. And unfortunately, I missed the part where I was supposed to learn how to do that. And I'm sure you can. And there's plenty of people who go to school just for that. And those guys are kicking it out of the park. Um, but what I do know is I went to Pune, India in 2006, 2007, one of those years. It's a long time ago. Um, to teach software that I'd built. Uh, I built a, a platform of software. This is when I was an enterprise developer. I flew out to Pune, India. Uh, I went through New Delhi all the way to Pune, and I did all the things you do in India as a, as a white guy who doesn't know anything about the world. And um, I, I noticed that a lot of these people didn't have, like, houses even. Uh, some of them had a difficult time with shoes. Uh, and I, all I, I had the I, – at first I had that weird, like, the white person thing that happens. It's so incorrect. They're like, I should fix everything. Like, the weird – Super, uh, super uh, terrible. Like I, the, the false yeah, sense CBR. of helping. You know, uh -huh. like that. And in the meeting, I was like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's. Th these people are a functioning society. I would like to know how, how the society works. How to get into, like, how to figure out um, how life is different outside of my westernized in Seattle, Washington circle. So I was in Chicago at the time, but still, same. I mean, just different place in, sure. uh, in America. I um. I couldn't commit to like appropriate communication with the, the team that I was working with. We had all these moments. Everything was kind of going because it was mostly code, and that's easy. That's like universal. Um, but we'd get to like personal moments. It was really hard. And then I went to a movie. I went to a Bollywood movie with them. I saw a movie called Hey Baby. It's incredible. It's also terrible. It's also incredible. It's also 15 hours long. Um, then there's dancing, and you eat samosas in the theater, and it's the best. But um, I realized that all the tropes on the screen were stuff that we all, we all know. Mm. Oh, I like the girl, and I'm embarrassed that I can't get the girl. My friend's trying to tell the girl that I like her, and th those those moments. So I came out, and I just started talking about Star Wars, and and immediately everybody, everybody on the team, uh, Muslim, Hindi, uh, rich, poor, everybody, the the guy who owned the programming business in a suit, and the guy with the leather motorcycle, uh, leather uh, jacket and motorcycle, and the guy with the with the the sandals and the the, the three year old. They we all. Mm. Talked about Darth Vader. That's that's yep. impact. That's that's impact. We were trying to talk about actual human development to each other and couldn't. We couldn't but like really have been afraid if you had thought to yourself, I don't want to look like a nerd, my image is what comes first, yeah, yeah. identity yeah. to these people, I'm not gonna talk about Darth Vader. You right. would have missed that genuine connection. And, and it was purely genuine. And so and that tells me something. If mm. you can create something that impacts people, a story that impacts people, that's now an envelope. Unfortunately, Darth Vader uh, didn't, and I'm not saying that this is shitting on Star Wars in any way, but, but Darth Vader didn't carry with him, like, a way to change Earth. Mm. It was a really entertaining story. And I'm not saying I'm going to be able to, or, or I, I will spend my entire life attempting, but I'll be able to change Earth at all. I would love to try. But, but if, if I can tell a story that traverses all those boundaries, if somebody can, now I don't think Brickstone Wood's the guy, but if, if somebody knows about Brickstone Wood somewhere else, and Brickstone Wood does a thing that changes the person, that... That's the impact. That's the surgeon saving one of those lives that has spawns a generation that changes everything. Then on my deathbed, I can say at least, look, say what you will about George Lucas. That's a guy who on his deathbed will think to himself, I made an entire generation of people believe one thing. Mm. You know? Like yeah. an entire generation of people. Uh, that's, that, no, ah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a noble cause. Whether or not the end result, whether or not the Phantom Menace sucked, it, 
<laughs> I, I like all the prequels myself. myself. I'm a, I'm, a I, I'm actually I, I was I was first in line and I uh, I didn't realize what was wrong with them until I was told by a bunch of Star Wars nerds what was all wrong with them. And yeah, I totally agree. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, Jar, Jar Jar is the only thing I have like immediate ill with. But I was I wasn't super into Star Wars, so I didn't I wasn't super offended immediately. It was like, oh, this is fun and kind of weird and doesn't have like the best story and is the acting is kind of shoddy in places. Just like A New Hope. But uh, you say yeah, that to a Star Wars guy and he's going to punch you right in the face. He's going <laughs> to drop you instantly. I wonder, that, I can't help but wonder, speaking of tangents, sure. John Carpenter, I love his earlier movies. Once we yeah. get to close to war, I'm like, eh, uh, you know, uh, the, Paul McCartney, who doesn't love the Beatles? Well, his recent stuff, uh, something happens when people get older. And yeah. some people think it's got to do with this uh, the being far beyond the generativity versus stagnation yeah. stage of psychological development. Like the stuff you were talking about earlier, people uh, who want to be something versus people who want to do something. Yeah. And what you were advising them is just do it, then you will be it. But it's very hard when you haven't gotten to this stage that comes after identity versus role confusion, which is right. generativity versus stagnation. That's when you're like, I gotta make, I gotta make, I gotta make things, I gotta make things. Yeah, I'm like 35, man. I'm terrified that tomorrow I'm gonna wake up and be like, well, whatever, the world's the world. I'm gonna die. Like, I, don't, I don't want that. I don't want that at all. I wanna wake up every day. Like seriously, ask anybody who's close to me. My my life consists of like, what, why am I not like. Uh, like seriously, I'm having a big long 90 minute conversation with you because I think it will help me get to a place where I can like do a thing. If if you were just some guy, bro, I'm sorry. We'll have this conversation if I'm eating or doing something, but I've got to be going toward oh, making sure. something. Otherwise, I've got four jobs. I know what you're talking right? about. Right? Right? Yeah. I, I own a film company and a game company, and I'm trying to make big things with both of them, and it's really hard, and I need to be doing that. Otherwise, I feel deflated and empty. And maybe that's a psych psychosis. Maybe that's completely No, no. Broken. You're in generativity versus uh, uh, stagnation. Sure. You are the kind of person who you know, it doesn't seem like you do things on a small scale. Seems cool. like when you're doing that stage, you're doing it to the max. And it's great advice for yeah. people who are on the prior stage uh, who are trying to figure out how do I be a person that I like being, that I'm proud mm -hmm. of being, that if I show off this person, uh, show off myself, I can be proud of it. Just get to the other stage and start doing things that you actually are genuine and in love yeah. with. And then you'll be an awesome person. I'm pretty can, sure it's easy that. I think. Can I throw a thing out there? There's no. There's, it's, it's fear. It's Fear is, if you've read Dude, man, fear is the mind killer. Fear is mm -hmm. the total death that brings total obliteration. Fear is the worst. Well, I don't know why we're so afraid of it. Are we getting shot at today? Then stop. Stop giving a shit. Give a shit about we're, nothing. We're hardwired um, for it. Human yeah, beings. Yeah, we really are. Are. Every, exactly. I say in motivational growth, I say a thing. Um, fire a gun in the zoo. Like, like fear is universal. Fire a gun in the zoo. Everybody will get spooked, even the tigers. Like, that's something mm -hmm. I say in the movie. I believe that. I'm with you. But I think having abstraction allows us to get around the fear. I, 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 I was speaking recently with a friend who was like, well, I don't want to look a certain way. And I was like, why not? And like, well, what if somebody uh, is turned away from me? I was like, well, check it out. Statistically, if you take like births and deaths and old people and young people and take, try to dunk it, there's about five and a half billion people on earth at any given time who can interact with you socially. Normally, there's seven billion people, but there's like people being born and people dying, people, whatever. There's about five and a half billion. If you lose one, uh, uh, you gotta, but you'll never, you'll never go through them all. Like let, let's just keep trying to find the right ones and lock onto those things if they work. But if somebody's gonna look at you and judge you because of your hair. Maybe that's not a guy you need to be talking to. What does that mean for a future bigger conversation? If somebody's going to judge you because, like, your short pants weren't tight enough or whatever, then why why do you want to be with that person who would judge you that way? That's mm -hmm. a – and you can say that all day long. Nobody will ever listen. We have this thing <laughs> to do. It's called the grace mechanism. It's this, this deal where, like, I'm you're doing it right now because you can't not. Every human being does it. But I'm talking to you, and you're taking everything I'm saying, and you're filtering it through you, and part of you deep down inside is going, yeah, well, but, you know, I actually know what the truth is. Everybody does that. It's because uh -huh. like we're running away from the tiger. And we look at the guy next to us, and we're like, "Well, as long as I survive, things will work." <laughs> like that's it's a survival mechanism, right? So uh -huh. you have to have it, and you have to get past it a little bit. You have to, to to step beyond it. And I think the best way to do that is like tragedy. Like we, my company, uh, Immigrant Films, was defrauded in 2010 for like a shit ton of money, and we we were brought to our knees. And it was one of those moments where I was like, "It can be, it can be over. We're gonna be over." And, and, and everything was ruined, and we had to see, can we, can we raise it up? Can we step up? Can we break every rule and do everything to rise up? And we did, and here we are making cool stuff. Um, it's, so there, there's this thing where you get to the point where once you get enough like impact, on, uh, you know, beat on enough, you realize, ah, maybe the guy calls me a jerk. It's not as bad as him beating me to death, so maybe I'll take it. I'll take that. <laughs> like, so, That's why I actually like Rocky Six a lot. I don't know if you've seen it. 
the theme is like, can you just continue to get hit? Yeah. yeah. And if you no, can totally. stand, that's how you know you're a success. Yeah. Not whether you were able to beat the other no, guy. No, yeah, no, if you can just, I did it. He goes, at the very end, he goes, she's dead. And he's like, I did it, Adrian. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Yep. It's a legit movie. Yeah, yeah. It's super legit. I love that movie. Good thing. So, yeah, that's, that's, we went, are we even talking about video games anymore? Yeah, we are. We're talking about oh, video games are life. You. Well, they, they kind of are. Life yeah. is set up. It's structured like a game, it's I totally. think. We think about, do I win, do I lose? Uh -huh. I'm afraid of that, but I'm excited about being able to, to beat it. How do you twist your anxiety into excitement? Because it's all about energy. It's all about yeah. anticipating what's going to happen next. Fear and anxiety, I mean, uh, excitement and anxiety are all about future thinking and, and feeling about what's going to happen instead of looking so much at the present or the past. But you have turned this fear you might have had of, in particular, uh, to be specific, You've brought it up a few times, afraid of that deathbed and looking back and being like, Jesus, what did I do? Yeah. You've turned your fear of that and used it to overpower any sort of fear of humiliation or failure or, you know, yeah. and, and are using it to uh, have a pretty awesome life at PAX South, talking to, to strangers <laughs> about these ideas you had and they're listening to you intently there, and there, I'm listening to you intently. There's pretty something awesome. amazing about it. it um, if you do it, if you... So we had originally for Star Mazer, uh, when it was just a concept video, we had uh, Jeremy Perrin from Paris. Um, I know I'm pronouncing it not French, but every time I say like Jeremy Perrin, I sound like an asshole. So I'm not doing that. Um, but uh, we had him do all the concepting. He had a team, and they did the concepting and a bunch of the original art, and it was really, really incredible. Uh, we've taken that and given it to an incredible, incredible, incredible workhorse of uh, a pixel artist uh, named Christina Antoinette Neo Fatisto, who is amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. And she has taken that art style and grown on it and exposed uh, all of the game stuff. So, so the original original video that was in Motivational Growth, which was it went on the internet for a while. If you read, those are awesome. Again, sorry to cross students, but there's a kill screen article um, about. It's called uh, Star Mazer was always real because there was a oh, weird thing cool. where some animator saw Jeremy posted in his reel parts of it, and he said, "Look at this. This is like for, like." I wish a game like this would be real. Mm -hmm. And then the internet for like a period of a year was like, oh my god, this is the best fake game ever. And it, I'm sitting there like, I, I'm making shut. Oh shit! Like, how well, there was a trailer, trailer I saw. I saw it, a really it, awesome trailer for it. it, it it's the same. It's it's not the same, but it's it's close to the trailer we're showing now because that's the trailer that I wanted for my game. So right. I paid for that fucking thing. We, we you, we've made it so that now I can provably do everything you can do in the trailer plus a whole bunch of other stuff. And the arts expanded, and everything you see has been refit and awesome. But um, but there's this moment where uh, uh I'm sorry, how did I get here? Because I just got uh, oh yeah, uh, we were talking about how you, you yeah. Picked yeah. Up. So she's picked it up, um, and and you. So it's visually really stunning. Alex Meyer does an amazing uh, musical score for it, uh, and I'm standing there, Pax, Pax South, watching people walk by, without fail, 100% of the time. If somebody's eyes catch it, whether or not they come to my booth, their head just kind of like chicken tilts with it as they walk by. Like they have to, they have to watch it. So it's not so much that like. My my uh, hatred of fear of death or whatever is driving this thing. It's that plus mm. really great artists. Plus really great music. <laughs> but plus those really, really great artists, I I have to guess that because uh, tons of games go on Kickstarter all the time. Sure. A lot of them look really cool, but they just don't resonate with people as a as a genuine a, like explosively passionate piece of work that you should get behind. Like, people will sure. see a game on Kickstarter and be like, it looks pretty cool, but sure. do I want to, like, back it? Do I want to, like, join the team? So no. I give my money to something, yeah. You are the kind of guy people want to join the team. You, you, I, I, uh, I've been told exactly that by the team, so I have to believe that. <laughs> but I have the, okay, I was just at a really cool sound panel uh, at Peck South with um, Akash the Car, with uh, Ryan Ike, and with Jacob Purnell uh, talking, and those are all really, look them up, they're incredible dudes. Um, they were talking about uh, uh, imposter syndrome. Mm. Like, successful people or, or non successful, all people, I think, to some degree have imposter syndrome. Every time somebody says, I'm on this team because you're incredibly energetic, I think, well, what happens tomorrow when I'm not? And it sucks and you hate me and it's over and it's all, I lose everything. So I, I can't, like, rely on. I've been told, yes, you have an energy that people are attracted to. That's really great, but that's not what. I want to make a thing, so let's make a thing together. Like, that's where I am. So. <laughs> and then, and then you see the the wonderful irony in that. And that <laughs> the people are like, let's make this about your identity, Don. You're this kind of guy. <laughs> and you're like, no, we have to make stuff. Why are we thinking yeah. about who we are? Why aren't we making things like that? Yeah. Because you are the kind of guy who wants to be making all these things. 
uh, you have this identity the, that you project out without trying. It doesn't seem like, like if you were faking this somehow, you, you'd need to get the Academy Award like tomorrow. <laughs> Oscars. Some... So I got six of them, 12 <laughs> Oscars. I am the Academy Award. I, my name is actually Oscar. I have a sword and everything. I have body paint. It's the best. <laughs> so many directions I can go into this conversation. We only have nine minutes left. We have a couple of questions. I'll get to the questions real okay. Well, no, not quite. Before that, okay. I can't help but uh, want to ask. Because to me, it's very interesting that Star Mazer is uh, only a couple of days on the market. It's, it's clicking with people like really fast, yeah. it seems like, which yeah. is wonderful to see, and I'm expecting great things. But motivational growth, uh, from what I'm gathering anyway, it, it didn't click with people as quickly, even though to you, I'm sure, making them both felt the same way. You're just putting yourself right. out there. Right. Uh, what do you think it is uh, about the motivational growth, even that it just didn't like blow up in that way? Okay, so um, motivational growth is uh, movie making is expensive and hard. Um, I, I I do it professionally, like for I do all kinds of. You'll post links to all of the game trailers. You'll go to imagosfilmscom slash our work, and you'll see a big list of our our current work. You'll see that we do good stuff. Uh, myself and a team of 30, not just me, do really good work. Um, but it's expensive and hard. So uh, what I what I run into is um, I have to balance. Like I've got only X money. Um, we're asking for roughly the production budget of motivational growth for this game. Huh. Uh, our production budget was $197,000. We had post-production budget as well, but um, it, it wasn't a lot of money. And I couldn't go really gigantic with it. I couldn't blow up buildings and make giant robots. And I'm not insulting those. I have our giant robot script, man. But um, I, I couldn't do any of that. What I had to do was go deep. Hmm. I did want to tell us I had a story in me. I don't want to make a story that I don't actually have in me. I don't want to do a thing because, you know, whatever, I got money. I want to make a real story that I've got in me. And I had one kind of about being lost in the press. I could make a movie about a poor guy who's lost in the press. Uh, who would want to watch that? So I made a weird movie. I made a movie that whether you like it or you hate it, you remember it. Mm. That's, and you think, oh, you're the motivation. I had somebody at PAX Prime 2014. I was hiding behind a – I was working – I'm still working with Robot Loves Kitty to make their uh, game uh, Upsilon Circuit, which is oh, cool. a really amazing game. I'm the writer, the head writer on that game. Um, I had no idea. Awesome. But I was operating this giant Ronald Reagan Max Headroom head, yelling at people because that's one of the main characters. Uh, I'm, I'm operating this, and a guy walks by and tries to peek behind to see, like, how is it being operated. And I just hear out of nowhere, motivational growth guy! <laughs> <laughs> He remembered the thing and stuck with him. So it resonates. It, yeah, you're right. It's not resonating enough. And it, well, no, reason, it, it's it, more that I, I, I did my question wrong. Star Mazer yeah. is really marketable. And yeah. it's because I think it's expressing this idea that people are hungry for right now. Sure. Yeah. Motivational growth sounds awesome. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to watch it now. When when I saw little bits of it, I was like, maybe it'll be good. Like I wasn't sure yeah, right yeah, off the yeah. bat, and you don't know until you've given something a chance whether it's it's going to resonate with you or not. Sounds like the people who have watched it, many of them, it meant a lot to them. Yeah. But getting people to actually watch it, it seems like it was a different process for that movie than it's been for the yeah, game. Yeah, okay. So I, far. I, I think it's your question. Um, it's super simple. I made motivational growth as an adult filmmaker. I'm making Star Mazer as a nine year old who wanted to make a game. Uh, no, seriously, I, this is a game I always wanted to make. It really is. Huh. Um, as for profitability in films and commercial viability of films and stuff, I'm going to say something. This is going to be another one of those clips that they cut out, and then they never, uh, they just loop it on Vine or something. I'm the worst human. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Um, um, like, I think, what, what have you got so far? Like, I hate hipsters or something? That's one of those. That's gonna be <laughs> um, but here, here we go. Michael Bay is the most successful filmmaker of all time. Hmm. He makes, he makes objectively the best movies. If I'm an alien culture and I fly to Earth and I just do a scan, his last movie, which is his worst movie, it made um like a billion dollars in like a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, objectively, Earth, the planet, loves his films the most. They are the most commercially viable films. Uh huh. Uh huh. With the motivational growth, I didn't have the money. His movies are all explosions and tits and whatever. I didn't have any of that. I, I couldn't. I do. Well, there's a tip, but um. <laughs> So he yeah. makes, uh, the way I see him, he's a craftsman of action sci-fi pornography. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. And it, it's, it's incredibly well made. Uh, I never, yeah. Uh, but I, I can't, I can't express that. I can't go to space and blow up a bunch of stuff or whatever. With 250000 production budget, I, I can't. I mean, maybe With somebody else. game, you can. 
with came, pixel art, yeah. With, with, a, with an amazing artist, with an amazing uh-huh. developer, with myself writing, with my, the writer that I've got on board, with her writing as well. We, we can express, with that amount of money, the big, more commercial thing. If you read any of my other scripts, most of them are pretty commercial. Not, uh-huh. I always have the, the Don Decker thing that's in there that makes it not like Transformers, but but the, I do have a giant fighting robots movie. I, I got one of those. I also have like a tween movie where there's girls and Halloween and the sort of 13-year-old girl and guy and whatever. I have that too, but, but I also have like the depressed guy talking to a large chunk of talking fungus movie. I've got that as well. Um, but I think I think it's not as resonant because I couldn't be as commercial. I right. wanted something that I couldn't I needed to get into festivals, and, it, and if I wanted to get it into festivals that were about like the best middle middle tier commercial movies, th- there's so many more with a million dollars. I don't have the million dollars. Uh, there are um, uh, in in 2013, I was up against at least two movies with 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 sub five million but over three million dollar budgets about people falling in love. How the fuck am I supposed to like fight that? Like I got. <laughs> You got Jim Jacobs in your money. movie for like hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's incredible. Uh, well, you know, he, the rest of the movie costs nine bucks, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 he's, it, it's because Jeffrey Combs is incredible. I mean, the guy, he read this script on a plane, he, he called his agent, his agent called me and said, Jeff's interested. I chat all over my office. And then he, he got on the plane and read it again and called me himself. And then he said, listen, I wanted, I'm interested in your movie. He didn't say I'm interested in the money. I'm interested in the, the SAG fees. I mean, you know, he's, he's interested in the movie. He was interested in the story, and he thought he could do a thing. So we worked together really hard uh, to, to fit the budget and fit the time and everything and, and made it happen. And I'm proud that he was in it, and I'm proud that he supports it, and I'm lucky, frankly, to have gotten him for that. And I am super not allowed to point out that if we were to get our budget and all of the paperwork that go through, he might be a star master. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> I will forget that he said it. Uh, that is yeah, the great. internet won't. <laughs> <laughs> he is a hell of an actor. Uh, he he and and, thing. and to yeah. clarify, just so that my little joke doesn't go, uh, you, you have to talk to agents, and we've started talking to one of agents. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, what's. You never announce anything until it's already done. No, and I'm just, I'm mostly just kidding. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, agents haven't talked to, so I'm, I'm kidding so much as I can get out of this conversation if it doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see a mushroom with a familiar sounding voice mm-hmm. in Star. That's but I need I, I need that budget. I need the Kickstarter to go through to make that happen. Well, of course. Yeah, Actually, yeah. Well, so far, so good. He and a bunch of others are one of the stretch goals. But anyway, let's get huh. back to what you were talking about. I don't well, know, we I'm only have two minutes left in the ding-dang show, unfortunately. We have questions. Yeah, Roth Safi, who did the soundtrack for uh, Zeo Drifter. Very, oh, uh, wow. Dude, I love that. that game. I'm so in love with that game. <laughs> I swear to God, I got into my, my 3DS during like a sale or something. I played it constantly. I love that game. It's so simple and so perfect. It is I like gave it a, a pretty high review myself. I it's reviewed so it good. Uh, Renegade it's Kid, so Roth Safi did the yeah. music. You can be wow. friends with Roth Safi. He's a wow. person. That's so uh, good. asks, what music do you listen to while working on the game? I'm gonna I'm gonna say something really cheap. This answer is super cheap. Go to Kickstarter. I'm not saying this to to vet. You don't have to buy, but go to Kickstarter and look at the music list that we've got. Mm. I went to everybody that I listened to. I did. Uh, I went to Telefuture. I went to the record label Telefuture. I'm like, I need your artists. I need these artists because this is what's playing while I'm working. I, I you know I went to everybody on that list to somebody whose music was playing when I made the game. And it's Alex Maurer, our actual composer. By the way, the the, the, the music is structured. The music for the game it's got its own soundtrack. It's got its own composed soundtrack by Alex Maurer, chip music extraordinaire. Unbelievable. He's also half owner of Imago Softworks, so it's, you know he's doing his thing. Um, but we also have, just like in a movie that has its own composed score, but that has like rock music in it, we also have these guest artists. So I went to him, obviously, because he's working on the stuff with me no matter what. He was going to do it, but, um, and I listened to his music. I listened... If you get the soundtrack to Motivational Growth and don't get the movie, do that. It's fine. It's so good. It's so good. Um, but... I also listen to these artists. Uh, every single one of those artists on that list is somebody that I was listening to while coming up with the game, while working on the game. It's something that we have streaming in the office. It's uh, really good. Uh, unfortunately, not Renegade Kid, but I any, any, any Renegade Kid's music, but um, like any of the, the, uh, the game. I would yeah, love the soundtracks to their games, yeah. The soundtracks, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Any, well, any, anything Zombie that's ever been used for Renegade Kid's games, I have not listened to while making the game. I have listened to, though, and again, uh, that game, Zero Drifter, is incredible. Yeah, so, is it good? I'm so happy yeah. it turned out that but way. But no, yeah, go, go, go to the list. You'll see. Uh, yeah. that's, that's what I've been listening to. And luckily, only one said no. Only one. Mm, not bad. And and the answer wasn't because your game sucks, fuck you. It was good, like, oh shit, I wish, I wish, I wish. But right. I'm currently like up to my eyeballs doing another indie title, which I am super excited about. And we're doing a crossover with. Oh, uh-huh, cool. Wow. Yeah. All right. But I'm not going to tell you. Good, I know, I know. 
Still, there's so much uh, on the on the horizon for Star Razor. So if it works, I want it. Yeah. So do we have any any more questions? Just yes, so we, we have one more question. Sorry about that. We're a little over time. Kev asks, do you find that being transparent about your development helps things or hurts things? Does feedback taint your vision? All right. Being transparent transparent is is important, but we're not um we're not a two way street. We're transparent about what we're doing. We're not transparent about what we'll do. Um, I'm sorry. No, that's wrong. I pro I make a promise of what we'll do. It your input won't your input will matter. It will always matter. But I am I made a promise with Star Mazer. I showed you a thing that I'm going to deliver. It uh -huh. doesn't matter if we make $161,000 or $100 million in the Kickstarter. I made a promise. I'm going to hit the promise. The promise of what we're going to deliver and the promise of the date. Those are the promises I'm adhering to. I can't let anything ride me anyway I can't be worried that one one guy or 100,000 guys will like it or not like it based on one feature or another feature I will make the game I promised mm. right Shigeru Miyamoto makes a promise makes a game he doesn't he'll listen Nintendo might listen or whatever but uh, you get Pikmin's Pikmin it's going to be Pikmin I had an idea I was out in my, my you know I was out in my garden and I came up with an idea and made a, made a game um I have a promise I'm making with Star Mazer if, if the promise doesn't su suffice for you I will make another game Mm -hmm. I will I will refactor what I want to make and make that. But but I'm making a promise to you with Star Mazer. I'm going to deliver that. My team's going to deliver that. We're going to say ironclad in that. We will of course take suggestion. We will of course bend the path slightly. But you're not going to be like, well, I wish yeah, you, the, you, the ship turned into a giant robot. I mean, I wish that too. But that's not in the cards. I mean, there's a very detailed history of what that ship is and how it goes and whatever else. So, um, so yeah, people don't like the delivery promise. girl. You're not going to cut her before she even gets a role. You're not going to change the third act and trim those hey, four minutes. No, no, no. It's going to live, and I'm going to learn from that thing. And some, to some people, there's a guy out there with a motivational growth head, too. That guy, it, I made the movie for him. I didn't know I did, but I did. I made a movie. He loves it. The other guy who hates it thought the middle was a little saggy. Cool. I've learned. The last script that I just wrote, one of the, uh, the constant evaluations was, does it sag a little on the middle? So I learned from <laughs> the mistake, right? Sure, um, the feedback's helpful. But yeah. the one thing lives on its own, and Star Mazer will live on its own, and hopefully live for a long time, because like I said, it's completely modular, and every time I drop something in, it exponentially grows. So that's really great, and and, and if we can keep it up, Star Mazer will continue to go. I, again, like Minecraft, there are people who wanted some things in Minecraft, and they fought and fought and fought and fought, and finally they got into Minecraft. Maybe that happens in the future. Let me make the game first. Let me finish the game. Let me get something out there, and then you can tell me how much you hate it. We will continue to be transparent. We will continue to show stuff. We're also, because I'm also a film company, this is me um, hedging my bets a little, we're doing a documentary. This Parts of this, if you'll allow, will probably be in the documentary. Absolutely. We are doing a documentary about the making or failure of Star Mazer. Uh, the idea sounds very arty. Well, you know, at the end, if you go 30 days in the Kickstarter and it fails miserably, and you put all this money in up front, and you got all these hopes up, and everybody's excited, and Jonathan Holmes is the greatest thing ever. Um, what happens when it fails, and it's a cool documentary we love. It's not being arty, it's hedging my bets. I have a film company. I'd love to sell that movie. <laughs> yeah, and without money, you can't make more stuff. Exactly you right. So get, you know, we're yeah. documenting everything, and we're posting a lot of it online every day. We are attempting to be not the most transparent. We don't give a shit about other transparency, but we are going to be very transparent the whole time. We'll constantly be updating stuff. We're going to be doing video logs and blogs and all kinds of stuff. Keep an eye on our dev blog, man. Eight times a day at the very least it's updated. Um, and we'll keep it up for the entire duration of the Kickstarter and then through the entire development of the game. That is a promise as well. And that's something that I want to keep transparent. And like I said, it's not going to necessarily bend to, to any high degree what we're actually doing. I'm going to stick to the promise. Right. Good. Don. Yes. I know it's been a good episode. When I've said like five things. No oh, shit, I'm sorry. No, no, that's what I want. I, I don't get make to the eagle. <laughs> if I wanted to have a show that was about me talking, I could just you know start up a live stream on YouTube anytime. I do this show sure. to talk to people just like you, and thank you so much for filling the time with so many ideas. I'm already I have a pretty good sense of this, having done the show for a little while. This is going to be one of those episodes where at least a few game developers will be like, "Holy shit, you guys have to watch this one." Well, thank uh, you. More I landing episodes promise. like that. Tim Tim Rogers episodes like that. This one. You I, just put I, me like in a pantheon. I don't deserve the pantheon, <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> I think you and Lauren Landing actually. That would be. It, it might be uh, too much. Like there might actually be fire, like coming <laughs> off of your bodies with all this energy you both have. Like yeah, it might. Be. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, they can follow you on Twitter. You're at Skinny Tie, is that correct? Yeah, at Skinny Tie. That's my personal Twitter. You can follow Star Mazer at Star Mazer. There's two R's because we wanted more R's than any other Star game. Um, <laughs> Star Mazer. Uh, it's actually I stole it from Brave Star, which is really awesome. Oh, that's pretty very. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, 
and, and the Silverhawks. Brave Star and Silverhawks are huge inspirations. So at StarMazer, if you want to follow my uh, my game studio, it's Imagos Softworks. It's I M A G O S S O F T W O R K S uh, at Twitter. Uh, we also have Facebook pages, Facebook.com slash those things, removing the at. Uh, you can follow Imagos Films at the exact same thing, Imagos Films, I M A G O S F I L M S. Um, and then you can, we have all kinds of links and stuff going from there. Imagos Films also updates eight times a day, and there's some crazy stuff on there. Right now, we're just wrapping up a uh, really, really incredible Western thing we did for Adult Swim, and there's all kinds of pictures of that. So keep your eyes open. Go to uh, starmazer.com slash Kickstarter. That'll point you in the right direction during the Kickstarter and point you to our, oh my god, it was an epic failure page at the end of the Kickstarter, and uh, you will have a great time keeping a track of what's going on with Star Mazer and Imagos. It's worth it just for the animated GIFs. Like, I, yeah. I was mad that I couldn't just post every GIF from yeah. your page onto Destructoid and be like, you're welcome, guys. You know, yeah, if you... Weekend. If you want to, if you want to go crazy, uh, follow Cast Pixel on Twitter. That's C A S T P I X E L. That's our lead artist, um, Christina Antoinette Neofotistu. She's incredible, and she posts those things constantly. Sometimes, where I'm like, I kind of wanted to hold back on that. It was incredible. I'd like to want... No, no, no. I'm posting it. Okay, good. Go for it. You got it. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to make her unhappy. You no, no, because she's she's the machine. We're all the machine. That's the cool thing. Every single person on the team is just, yeah. We, we worked for 72 hours straight before kicking Chris, uh, Kickstarter off. Every single person on the team. At, everybody in the United States that was working on the team was, was, was in my condo, and she was up for, I think, 36 hours straight getting ready to, wow. to launch that thing. We are, we, we are devoted to this thing. We, we will live and die by this game, and we're so excited about it. Uh, me too. It's contagious. <laughs> can I join the team? Can I just be the coffee you, you guy? Can play, the you, can, you can play the old lady. The old Asian lady. <laughs> that one. Exactly. You did it already. We're just going to strip that from the YouTube. <laughs> yeah, take it away. Then I won't. Uh, then it won't be collusion. It'll be theft. Right. right. But I told you about it. It's not theft. You know. Oh, that's true. Damn it. Uh, me, I'm at Tron Knots on Twitter. You can watch the show later on YouTube, youtube.com slash subhome show. You can listen to it on Libsyn and iTunes. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.